Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I'm Margie Yamamoto, and on behalf of the Diversity and Inclusion Group here at Newbury Court, I'd like to welcome you to today's speaker, Paul Watanabe. I should warn you that we almost canceled because of the snow. We were worried about Paul having to drive all the way out here, but luckily he got up early and plowed his car out of this deep snow, and he made his way out this way, out west to us. So we're very fortunate. Paul Watanabe is professor of political science and director of the Institute for Asian American Studies at the University of Massachusetts. He received his BS degree from the University of Utah and his PhD from Harvard. In the community outside of the university, his is a familiar voice on national public radio where, he's, where he is often called upon to offer his succinct analyses of the political issues of the day. In 2012, he was the first chair of the U.S. Census Bureau's National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations. And in 2015, he was appointed by, Professor, by President Obama to the President's Advisory Commission on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. Locally and nationally, he sits on the boards of many organizations on civil rights, education, health care, and immigrant advocacy. Paul has received many honors for his tireless work in these fields, but his most recent honor was won on an international level. The government of Japan awarded him the Order of the Rising Sun for, and I quote, his deep and long-standing contributions to enhancing the social status of Japanese Americans in the United States. This is one of the highest awards given by the Japanese government to someone who isn't a head of state or leading government official. It's with great pleasure and honor we welcome Paul Watanabe here today to discuss with you a topic that is important to all of us. Paul? Thank you very much. Uh, so this so you can see me better. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank um, Margie and Mark for being such good friends and uh, inviting me once again to Newberry Court. As I said last time I spoke here, I've been here many times. Uh, Robert Naka, who was maybe some of you were here with him, he, he used to meet here and I used to know him quite well. <coughs> Jigs Ishihara, I think, was also so, someone who lived here and a good friend of mine as well. So. Uh, I have fond memories of Newberry Court, and I'm very happy to come here again. And I want to thank Mark especially for uh, the nice uh, uh, brochure for this uh, talk. Uh, the one I submitted to him before was so boring that he uh, ripped it up and said that uh, that will not do. So he improved it significantly. So I want to thank him very much. I gave him something that uh, kind of a title a university professor would give to a talk, something very boring and uh, staid, and he made it look uh, interesting. Let me tell you that today's discussion is principally about the democratic search for a nominee for 2020. And, uh, and it, but it doesn't mean that you have to be a Democrat to be interested in the subject, of course. You can be a Trumper all the way if you want, and you still have some stake in who you think might be the best candidate for you to thump uh, should Trump be running again in uh, November of 19, of 2020. So I want to have really a lot of discussion. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. I always love coming to places like this. I'm used to talking to students who their reference points or they remember, maybe some of them remember the first Obama election or maybe back to Bush and that's about their point of reference. I was telling Margie and Mark, I love to talk to people who remember what it was like Henry Wallace ran for president of the United States. Uh, they remember, I, I hope nobody here remembers Hoover, maybe somebody here remembers Hoover. But certainly they remember Adlai Stevenson, that's always a test of mine. And so it's wonderful to have people with that kind of a long background on politics. How about JFK? And JFK, of course, uh, I figure that's a a given, that's like tomorrow for a lot of people, uh, yesterday for a lot of people. So 
uh, I really want to have a discussion about this, but let me begin by talking, uh, give a little bit of an idea about how I want to proceed. I want to talk about the road to the Democratic nomination, which of course is making news every day. It made a news about an hour and a half ago when one of the candidates dropped out, Kamala Harris. <clears throat> so I want to talk to, the, about the candidates themselves, the strategies, and some thoughts and discussion with you about the candidates and, the and, and, and what the strategies might be for the Democrats. And again, I've always felt that people are really experts on two things to themselves. One is their own education. People can talk all the time about their own education and, and their thoughts about it. And secondly, is about politics. So I'm allegedly an expert on politics. But I, I realize you're all more expert than I am and certainly uh, a lot more involved in this. And this is not talking, you're not an expert on football or something. None of you play for the Patriots that I'm aware of, but you have your thoughts about it. But this is a game, if you will, the politics game is when you're, you're actually a participant. And therefore it's meaningful to you. You actually, your own thoughts, your own actions, your own beliefs are critical. The most critical thing, in fact, are you and maybe six million other people like you who will decide who the next president of the United States will be. And you're one of those six million. So you play a role in this process. So it's something that you should be interested and should be engaged in. So I want to give a little bit of background about the Democratic uh, nomination process because I think a lot of people need to know the rules of the game before. And I think, again, many of you may know them, but I want to remind you of some of the, the, the background for the 2020 election. First of all, this, the, 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 the nomination is all about delegate selection, selection of delegates who will, in the Democratic case, go to Milwaukee in, in mid-July at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, Mid-July, July 13th to the 16th, I believe, which is actually fairly early for, to have a convention. And usually the out party always has their convention first and there's no exception this time. It's going to be in Milwaukee, so predictably, you knew it was going to be in one of the battleground states and no, likely one of the states that the Democrats lost and felt they should have won that would have made a difference in 2016. So Milwaukee has been chosen. By the way, the Republicans have selected, did anybody know? Charlotte, North Carolina. And they are going to have their convention actually very late, August 24th to 27th. It's one of the latest times I've ever seen a presidential, uh, I mean, a, a, a national convention. So the Republicans are having theirs on 24th to 27th of August. Now, of course, the planning for that was the assumption that they already knew who their candidate was going to be. And they, they believed that that candidate was going to be uh, Donald Trump. I still still think they, they believe it is and it most likely will be. But if something should happen and they have to switch gears and have a different candidate, which is again small, it will give them very little time to organize for the general election by having the election so late in the game, uh, their convention so late in the game. But theirs is going to be in Charlotte, August 24th to 27th. Now for the Democrats, who will be assembled in Milwaukee will be about 4,600 delegates. And of these delegates, there will be about 3,850 who are so-called pledged delegates. They are delegates that are going to be selected by people like you and me by two mechanisms, primaries and by caucuses. And primaries by far is the principal way that people are going to be selected. These delegates are going to select, get selected. It didn't always used to be that way, but the movement in the Democratic Party towards a more democratic process has moved towards having more direct involvement by the Democratic electorate in the selection of nominees. And that means more primaries. In fact, caucuses, as far as I can tell in terms of states, there's only gonna be three states that are gonna have caucuses in 2020. Iowa, which will kick off things. Secondly, Nevada. And thirdly, I think Wyoming. I think those are the only caucus states that are at their primaries, and I can talk a little bit about what the distinction is between the, the two of them uh, later on. So that's how these 3,850 so-called pledge delegates will be selected. They're pledge delegates because they're selected because of the results of the various primaries and caucuses. So they're delegates that are going to be pledged to a particular candidate on the Democratic side. 
In addition to the 3,850 pledge delegates, there are going to be 750 so-called PLEOs, or party leaders and elected officials, or better known as so-called superdelegates. And these superdelegates, 750 of them, are going to be unpledged delegates. In other words, they're not going to have to say in advance what candidate they're going to support or who they're going to support. They're essentially able to select whomever they want, although they're going to have certain preferences, obviously, but they're not pledged, they're not tied to any particular candidate. Now, of course, in the last election, uh, one of the great controversies was about the role of the superdelegates and the pledged delegates. If people remember in the Democratic nomination in 2016, the issue was raised whether Hillary Clinton, it was between Hillary Clinton and B Bernie Sanders. <clears throat> and Bernie Sanders was complaining that the so-called superdelegates, which were disproportionately going to support Clinton, should have been freed of their right to participate on a first ballot. And if so, Bernie Sanders had enough delegates that he was might likely to have prevented a Hillary Clinton at least first ballot victory. And so the Democrats who always, after they lose an election, always try to play with the rules in the next uh, time to try to ch transform, transform things. This is true after 1968, after they lost to Richard Nixon, they changed the rules. And after the Chicago convention, they changed the rules significantly for 1972. After the Democrats always lose an election, they always change the rules to some degree. And in this case, for 2020, they have made a very big change, responding to the controversy about the so-called superdelegates. <clears throat> and that is this. The pledged delegates, the 3,850, will be the only delegates who will be allowed to vote on the first ballot. So think about this. None of the superdelegates will be allowed to vote on the first ballot. And if one of the candidates gets a majority of the pledged delegates on the first ballot, they will get the nomination. In other words, the superdelegates would not have a say at all in the selection of the, of the nominee. The superdelegates can only vote on the second ballot or, further, or, or any subsequent ballot. So second ballots, and if they're not settled on the second ballot, the third ballot, fourth ballot, fifth ballot, or how many ever, ever ballots it takes to get a nominee. And a nominee will be a majority of all delegates voting. So that's a significant change if you think about it. So-called superdelegates, and so-called superdelegates are things like governors, congresspeople, national committee men and women, people who are active in the party, former presidents and vice presidents and so forth. These are people who are given traditionally in the Democratic Party now with the superdelegates, uh, delegates, uh, uh, status as delegates off the top, if you will. The f feeling is you've got to have some of the veteran leaders of the party who are delegates. But they will now only be allowed to vote in the second ballot if a first ballot victor is not selected. What this means potentially is the chance that the Democrats will have an open convention, meaning that a non-first ballot victory is increased and the significant likelihood that it might be that the case. And the superdelegates would only be able to kick in on a second ballot. This is a big change. I hope people realize that this is a response to really diminishing the role of non-pledged delegates and increasing the role of the primaries and the caucuses. Again, people like you in the role of selecting the nominee for the Democratic Party. Now, how do the states uh, decide how many delegates each of the states get? Well, it's a simple formula based on two factors. One, the size of the state, meaning the number of electoral votes. And secondly, the Democratic vote for president in the prior three presidential elections. So by some formula, the number of delegates each state gets is based upon that formula. What that means for the Democrats in 2020 is that the largest delegation will, of course, be California. It'll have 272 of the delegates. New York will be second with 183, Texas 149, Florida 143, Illinois 101, and Pennsylvania 100. These are the top largest delegates. The smallest delegations will be, who do you think? No, not Rhode Island. Rhode Island's reliably Democratic. It's small, but it's reliably Democratic. So it helped, it's helped with the one formula. Wyoming. Wyoming is the, as the smallest delegation, eight delegates. 
And there are uh, three states that will have only nine, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Alaska. So those are the smallest delegates. By the way, Massachusetts, anybody know how many delegates Massachusetts has the Democratic Convention? 59. It's actually a fairly large number because the electoral votes that Massachusetts have is not great, but it's a reliably Democratic uh, supporting uh, state. Now, in terms of their composition, the Democrats clearly have targets, and the targets are, number one, it must have gender equality. So that is, it must have 50% of its delegates must be women and 50% must be men. And in terms of other features like race and age, Democrats do have targets, but no quotas. And that's why it's demonstrable when you see the pictures of the conventions and the delegates themselves, there's no question that the Democratic delegations, the delegates are much more diverse by age, by race and gender, and by sexual orientation. There's no question about that. There's much greater diversity there. And that's because the Democrats make a significant effort to try to get the diversity and, and hit diversity targets. The Republicans have no diversity targets at all, and so they make no special efforts, although there are people within the Dem Republican Party who wish to try to diversify their delegation. But no, there's no question that the, that the composition of the, Dem of the Republican delegates to their convention is significantly older, as you might imagine, socioeconomically wealthier and whiter and more male than it is on the, uh, and, and more white and, and, le and more male than on the Democratic side. And that's partially because the Democrats make an effort to try to diversify their delegates. The important thing is uh, when are the primaries and caucuses to take place? As I said, in terms of caucuses, there are only three states, Iowa, Nevada, and Wyoming. And the whole game is going to get started in about exactly two months on March 3rd with the Iowa caucuses. Now, people know what the caucuses are as opposed to a primary. Many people are very big fans of caucuses as opposed to primaries. And the reason is this. What a caucus is, 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 is this, this could be a caucus, which is the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in Iowa meet together in small groups. They can meet at a church, at a school, in a senior citizens facility or something like that. It, at the precinct level is what they do. And they come together and they literally just have a meeting. And the purpose of the meeting is for the people in that meeting to decide who they want to support for president, uh, the nominee of the, the Democratic or Republican parties. And so they come together, people sign in, and this, in this particular meeting, let's say you're all Democrats who have come together to meet. And this would be a size of a pretty good sized caucus for Iowa, but some are much larger, some are smaller. But they, this is a pretty average sized caucus for, for Iowa. So think about it. There are people like you who have been called together on a, usually on a Saturday evening to come together. You sign in to make sure that you're a Democrat. You sign in and you sign into the caucus. And then what happens is that the, at some point, the head of the, the per person who's presiding will say, OK, all those people who are supporting Joe Biden meet out here in the lobby. All those people who are supporting uh, Elizabeth Warren, you meet in the uh, dining room. All those people who are supporting Pete Buttigieg, you meet. Uh, all those people who are supporting uh, Tulsa Gabbard, you meet in the bathroom. Uh, you know, uh, wherever uh, they try to get some sense about where people can meet and the size of the room that they have to have the meet in. And so everybody just gets up and they just go to their separate groups and they meet together and then you do some counting. And the counting is the interesting thing because it's e it would be easy. Let's say if you had 100 people in, like we almost have in this room, let's say maybe 100 people. And you say that 50 of, 50 of the people go into the Joe Biden room, then you say, OK, Joe Biden gets half of the delegates from that precinct, right? Very easy math. But let's say, for example, that the, the Buttigieg people only get 10% of the people. They, they have 10 people. And uh, the, uh, the Booker people, they get uh, five people. 
Well, the problem is, is that if you have 10 or 5, you're not what's called viable. And this is true for a caucus or for a primary. In other words, in order to get any de delegates, the, the, Republic, the Democrats say you have to get at least 15% of either the votes or the caucus votes or the primary votes. So you've got to get 15% to be what's called viable in order to get de delegates, right? So the delegates are assigned on a proportional basis, but you've got to get 15 to get any delegates. So using my example, Cory Booker and Buttigieg, is that, who the term, is that the two that I used? They have 10 and 5, so both of them are not viable, right? So they're not going to get any delegates. So, somebody, so then you see some politicking take place. You have the Buttigieg people who are only five short of, they, they've got 10 people, they're five short of getting a delegate. They go talk to the Booker people and say, you know, if your Booker people will come and join us, that'll give us 15, that'll make us eligible to get a delegate. Or two, maybe. And they'll say, you know, if you come and join us, we'll give you one of our delegates if you make us viable so that we can at least get one ourselves. And you see this horse trading taking place. And maybe uh, Elizabeth Warren might have uh, 30 delegates. And Elizabeth Warren says, gee, if we got 10 more delegates, we could get 40, 40, we could get 40 percent of the delegates rather than 30 percent of the delegates if we got 10 percent more. So they'll go over to the Booker people and say, you know, if you come and join us, your 10 people come and join us, we'll be willing to give you one of our delegates. If we might be eligible for four delegates, we'll give you one of our delegates. But no, the Biden people, they're at 50. They say, you know, if you really want to support somebody who's going to be really strong, why don't you come and join us and you will get one of our delegates. We'll get 60 percent now and you get one of our six delegates. And this horse trading takes place amongst the caucuses. Finally, at some point, they have to settle on what the numbers are and they'll come back and meet in the room and they'll say, OK, how many people are going to support Biden in our caucus? And it can be some particular number. And, the, and the, on the basis of that, they'll decide what the delegates will be. Now, frankly, these are not delegates that are going to appear in Milwaukee. They're delegates who will go to the next stage, which is at the state or county level. But that's not the critical thing. All the reporting is going to take place after that night, and they're going to add up the numbers and going to say who is the winner of the Iowa caucus. And the winner of the Iowa caucus is the person who, in these separate meetings, you add them all together, the ones that's got the largest support. So they can say that who the winner might be if Earl, if Earl, Earl Warren. Uh, if Elizabeth Warren gets 40%, uh, she'd be the winner of the Iowa caucus by far. Uh, my guess is if somebody gets about 35% of the vote, they'll probably be the winner of the Iowa caucus. And that's the, co and that's the first step in the process. It's in Iowa. And Iowa, it's very controversial, of course, because all this attention is being placed on Iowa which is not a state representative of anything, really. It's a very white state. It's a very heavily rural state. It doesn't have large urban areas. And yet it has an oversized influence on the outcomes. And then the thing moves the next week to New Hampshire. And the New Hampshire primary is going to be on uh, the, uh, the 11th of, uh, of uh, February. Did I say March? It, uh, yeah. The Iowa caucus is, is February 3rd, and the uh, New Hampshire primary is February 11th. And as people may know, the New Hampshire primary always is the first one, by, actually by New Hampshire state law. Even though the parties are the ones who control the process and the parties have tried constantly to try to rein in New Hampshire, New Hampshire has claimed it will always have the first in the nation primary. A couple years ago, they, there was a, some threat that it actually was going to be held in the year prior to the election year itself. <laughs> there was one year it was going to be almost around Chris, uh, uh, thing, uh, Christmas itself because the, the whole schedule got what's called front-loaded. The season, the, the primaries got earlier and earlier. This is relatively late to have it in, uh, uh, it seems to be late, but it's, it's, uh, it's relatively speaking. So it's going to be in February 11th. I think uh, there's been times in the last three or four elections it's actually been held in January. So the thing, and it's always because, again, New Hampshire states that they're always going to be the first in the nation. And thus the outsized importance of New Hampshire as well because, of course, all the attention that it gets for a state that is also wildly unrepresentative, predominantly white state, predominantly rural state. 
but yet gets outsized uh, attention. Now, frankly, I think the outsized attention is reduced a little bit when you have somebody like Elizabeth Warren, who's from neighboring Massachusetts, and by Bernie Sanders, who's from neighboring Vermont. You expect them to do well in their states are almost like homegrown candidates. But nevertheless, the attention is still there and is still high. So after what happens in New Hampshire, things get rolling very quickly. The next big uh, primary is South Carolina, the first, the first state within the South to have a primary. And then after that thing, things really get rolling. The March 3rd Super Tuesday primary is going to be held in which there are 14 states, 14 states that are going to have primaries on Super Tuesday. So this is a month after the whole process gets started in, in, in February 3rd of, 19, of 2020, by March 3rd of 2020, they're gonna have a primary that has 14 states. And after those 14 states, 40% of the delegates will already have been chosen on the Democratic side. So after only one month, 40% of all the delegates are gonna be decided. This is called front loading. The process is to try to get a nominee as early as possible. This is what the parties would love to have. They don't want to have the competition spread out over a long period of time. That's anathema to any party, and the Democrats are trying to avoid it. And the biggest thing about Super Tuesday, there's always been a Super Tuesday, but the important thing is that one state is moving them, their election up to that March 3rd date, and that state is what? California. California. Many people remember the 1968 uh, uh, primary where Robert Kennedy was assassinated after the California primary. Now, if people remember that, that primary and his assassination took place in what month? June. 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 It was the last primary. This is at the very end of the game. And, and California always has had a, a, pro, a, a primary very late in the game, and thus its impact on the nominee has been very modest in the sense that usually the nominee had been selected by that time. So what California has decided to do is move their primary up to very early in the process. And with 272 elect, uh, uh, delegate votes, its, its impact is huge. And so on Super Tuesday in 2020, it's not only the state of California that's going to be included, Texas is also going to be decided as well in, that, in, the, in the Super Tuesday primary. And by the way, Massachusetts is as well. So these 14 states added to those that go before, by that time, 40% of the Democratic delegates will already be chosen only a month into the process. And by the end of March, uh, just a few weeks later, 68% of all the Repo Democratic delegates are going to be chosen. This is really a process where you're not going to be waiting a lot, or hopefully uh, the Democrats hope you're not going to be waiting to crown a nominee in June or May, but really as early as the end of March, you can have a pretty clear indication of who the nominee might be. The idea is, is that the, inter the more competitive the battle is and the uh, inability to settle on the nominee only adds to the difficulties for the Democrats and makes it difficult to focus on who the Republican nominee, most likely uh, President Trump will be. That's the plan, we'll see if it works out, but uh, that's the idea of trying to so-called front load the nomination process in 2020. Now, uh, The process is included, and it will continue uh, next week, with the Democrats also trying to control the nomination process in terms of the debates themselves. The Democrats have sanctioned 12 presidential uh, uh, nominee debates, and the next, I think next, next month's maybe the next to the last, or pretty close to the next to the last debate, at least. And as people know, the Democrats have imposed some of these artificial limits as to who is allowed to participate in the debate. Uh, based on public opinion polls, 4% in at least that of four polls or an average of four poll in one of each of four major polls or polling an average of 4% over the four polls makes you eligible. You've got to raise a certain amount of money and that's making it very difficult for many candidates to appear on the debate stage. And the belief is unless you can appear on that debate stage, it's almost impossible to get any traction or any attention. 
that, that stage, as you know, for the first couple debates meant having two debates, having about 15 people in each of them. Indeed, the Democratic field at the start, and it's starting to change, was the most diverse and the largest of any in American history. The Democratic uh, nomination in terms of the people who were seeking the nomination, particularly at the beginning, was the largest and most diverse of any we've ever had compete for the presidency. Almost every racial group, every, uh, every uh, 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 we had gender diversity, we had racial diversity, we had diversity of all kinds represented by the Democrats. We're seeing that that is changing to some degree, but uh, that field is narrowing, and it narrowed about an hour and a half ago when Kamala Harris one of the few candidates, the one of two major, well, I guess now three with Deval Patrick Henry, one of the two initial uh, African-American candidates and one of three Asian-American candidates has dropped out of the field. So the, so the nomination leaders are starting to look fa fairly similar in the sense that you're, you're having three white guys, Biden, Buttigieg, and Sanders, who seem to be amongst the leaders, and a... Uh, and a female, a white female, uh, Elizabeth Warren. There is some diversity there, however. Elizabeth Warren, being a woman, of course, is somebody who we've never elected before in the history of the United States. Bernie Sanders would be the first Jewish man ever elected president of the United States. And of course, Pete Buttigieg would be the first person who was gay ever elected president of the United States. So even amongst that seemingly lack of racial diversity, there's a significant amount of diversity still represented by what are, I think by most accounts, the four leading uh, candidates. And the wild card, of course, is another Jewish uh, uh, New Yorker, Michael Bloomberg, who's entered the fray. And of course, Deval Patrick, who would be uh, a, who's an African-American male who has now entered the fray as well. I think that's about it for now in terms of who candidates. People always ask me, is Michelle Obama going to throw her hat in the ring? I doubt it. Uh, but, and everybody keeps saying, is Hillary going to throw her hat in the ring? I doubt it. But you, you still don't know. The field may not be set. But I think by now, it's pretty set. But I'm reminded, I was showing a film to my students uh, about the 1970, no, what was it? Yes, 1972 Democratic nomination. It's a film about Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman ever to run for president of the United States. It's called Unbossed and Unbought. And the thing I notice about that election is Shirley Chisholm announced her candidacy for president of the United States in January of 1972, of the same year. Now you say, wow, that must have been pretty late. But the front runner that year was Edmund Muskie of Maine, and he announced only a few months before that. So the notion of candidates announcing that they're running for president of the United States months and even years in advance is a fairly recent phenomenon. So while by any token, the notion of Duval Patrick announcing in November or Michael Bloomberg announcing in December seems way too late in the game, by historic standards, that would be considered very, considered very early in the game to announce your candidacy. Uh, well, let me say something about the candidates, but then let you have at it, because I know you must have your own thoughts. If you look at the polls, the polls is, and, and again, I think it's, the polls are very peripatetic, they're very schizophrenic, but right now, if you look at the polls, the, it's Biden, Warren, Sanders, and Buttigieg who are holding uh, sway right now. And various candidates are up and down over time. Biden was up and then he went down for a while, Warren was down and that, she went up for a while, she sort of plateaued. Biden is holding his own to the surprise of a lot of people. Sanders has been sort of slow and steady. You know, he's like the, what is it, the rabbit or something that just keeps going on and is pre predictable. You know what you're getting with Bernie. And Buttigieg seems to be the new latest flavor of the month uh, that uh, people are starting to getting attracted to. The question is, will he sort of rise and fall? Remember Kamala Harris, who we just talked about, if we had this discussion about two months ago, Kamala Harris was the one that people were predicting was at the leader of the pack after the first debate. She's now disappeared from the scene. In terms of fundraising, there's no question that Bernie Sanders and, and, and uh, Warren are the leaders in terms of, of uh, getting money from the public. Buttigieg is further behind. And Joe Biden is further behind as well. One of the signs that Joe Biden's candidacy 
had, was in trouble very early on is Joe Biden made a lot, raised a lot of money on the day he announced, as most candidates do. But after that, he totally flattened out, and he's really sort of flattened out still. He hasn't raised a lot of money, and Joe, so to think that the, Joe Biden, the front runner's biggest problem is raising money, people might not have predicted that. But it's a sign perhaps his candidacy has flattened, although his poll strength has remained pretty strong. Maybe it's the flip side of all of this Ukrainian stuff that the attention on, on Biden and his family, which you think might hurt him, has actually maybe helped him because it's Trump making the accusations. He's becoming martyred a bit because of the attacks by the Republicans on Biden. Let me end with some discussion about strategies. And, and I'm going to summarize some complicated strategies just in very simple terms. And remember that strategies have to be of two sorts. You need a strategy to win the nomination, a strategy to win the general election, and they're not the same. Because the electorate for winning the nomination is very different than the, the, the electorate for win, winning the general election. And to be able to be able to appeal to both is, of course, a real trick. And there's a lot of people that think that the Democrats in particular may be having trouble deciding what the strategy might be in terms of appealing to Democratic voters as opposed to the general election. But here's some of the strategies. First of all, there's one strategy that says, look, the focus of the Democrats must be on one thing, and that's removing Donald Trump. Anybody but Trump uh, is, the, is the call of those people who say, we got to get rid of tr Trump. That's the first priority. That's got to be our focus and our principal focus at all, at, at all times. And indeed, that suggests something that in political science we say for an incumbent president is almost always the way in which you go after an incumbent president. You, you make the election a referendum on the incumbent nominee, the incumbent president. If the, if, and you really focus very little on who's competing against them. You create a viable alternative. But if people are unhappy with the, the, the president they have, they have an alternative. The alternative is the candidate from the other party. And all you want to do is present them with a viable alternative to that, pre to that president. You make it a referendum on the incumbent. What that means, therefore, in these terms, is there's a real emphasis either on personality or on policy. And the Democrats uh, are wondering whether to focus on a personality that can, gra that can gra grab the attention of the electorate and the Democratic electorate and the national electorate or focus on policies that will do the same. And I think maybe the Democrats are feeling a little bit that their personality uh, light this year. They don't have an Obama-type character really to able to galvanize people. But they do have some people who talk about policies. And the question is whether that policies, rather than personality, is the best agenda for the Democrats going forward. And of course, the big one is whether the Democrats should really focus in on trying to win who, the, the voters they allegedly lost in the 2016 election, and that is the white working class male, often rural voters that were once the bedrock of the Democratic Party going back to the New Deal coalition. And the, the idea is you got to win back states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania that were lost and really decided the election in 2016. It's really trying to win back and broaden the appeal once again to people who were the Democrat, former Democratic, co part of that former Democratic coalition. On the other hand, there are people who say you got to mobilize the base, and they look to not the failures of, of, uh, of Hillary Clinton in 2016, but what they look for is the successes of Barack Obama in 2008, 2012 the broadened coalition of younger voters, people of color, and so forth, who led the Democrats to two straight victories under Barack Obama. And the idea of broadening the appeal, it means to really mobilize the base of the Democratic Party. And the base of the Democratic Party is principally to be found amongst those who are younger, that's the belief at least, lower income folks, and people of color. And the idea, if you don't have a candidate that can appeal to them and bring out those voters, uh, you're, you're, you're not going to have enough troops to, to, win the nominate, to win in 2020. So that's the big debate that's taking place. And I would say that last debate is the biggest divide that we have amongst the Democrats, whether to really focus on broadening the base, broadening the appeal, or mobilizing the traditional base of the Democratic Party 
the, the so-called Obama coalition in 20, 2008 and 2012. So let me uh, end by asking you a question and beginning discussion. So this election year, I think, is an important one. I'll answer my own question by saying, I think this is the most important election in my lifetime. But let me ask you this. You have a lot of experience. What, do you th what would you say are the most important election in your lifetime? And it doesn't have to be this one. So give me some thoughts about the elections. Many of you have experience having been involved with elections. What would you say was the most important election that you experienced? FDR. FDR, the, in what number? Probably. Well, he, he went back to 32, so uh, yeah, OK. So FDR ran four times. And he was a wartime president, and it was a president coming out of the Great Depression. So FDR. There's no question that a lot of people think that that and that that New Deal and the impact of it and, it and it shaped the Democratic Party for decades. It still shapes it today. Certainly people in your age group, it, it shakes it shapes the Democratic Party more than anything else. So others. Yes. FDR. Ronald Reagan. Sorry. Ronald Reagan. She said yeah. Ronald Reagan. She said Ronald Reagan. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I'll come over with the microphone for anyone. Ronald Reagan was 80, right? Yes, yeah, 80. Okay, yes. Truman. 52. No, uh, 48, you're saying, right? 48. Okay, Truman. Okay. Others. JFK. 60. The war on poverty and civil rights from the positive point of view, and then the Vietnam War from the negative point, it was an important election. Yep, and, it, and the 64 election was the most highly predictable election of all, maybe that in the 72 election. I mean, um, President uh, Johnson totally annihilated, if you will, the uh, the uh, Republican uh, candidate Barry Goldwater of Arizona in that election year, much like '72 when uh, Nixon totally beat the George McGovern. In fact, only one state voted for McGovern, and it wasn't South Dakota, his own state. It was Massachusetts. Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Just pass it. Yeah. Uh, this is a very surprising choice. The one we're about to do right now because the possible negative consequences are astronomical. And do you want to say something about, and, and you can go as far as you want, what do you think those negative consequences are? If um, all of the destruction that will happen if, the, if uh, Trump wins. Okay. So you're going to see a Trump victory is having some negative consequences along the lines you talk Huge. about. Okay. Carter, because he was not considered a liable candidate by many people, and I think he was. Yeah, well, he's one of those that they point to. Some of these people are down at 4 or 5% in the polls on the Democratic side point to because Jimmy Carter was not much higher than that in uh, December of the 1975 when he secured the nomination in 76. In fact, I remember in December of 1975, I was go going just right up here in Concord to Old North Bridge or something with uh, some friends of mine. And I remember that Jimmy Carter was down there shooting an ad for the uh, New Hampshire primary. And the person I was with said, who's that guy? And I actually got a picture taken with Carter, one of the, and I said, well, I was a political scientist, so I said, that guy may be the next president of the United States. I said, really? That short little guy? And that was Jimmy Carter. And I remember going down to the Concord, is it Concord Inn? The, I, I went down there to the bar to have drinks, and I remember Birch Bayh, who was a senator from Indiana, was there. There were about three presidential candidates having drinks there in the, uh, the Concord uh, in or colonial in that I guess that's what's called in in uh, in in there. So that was the days, but uh, yes, Jimmy Carter was a. Uh, he gives hope to those who are, who who maybe have low numbers. Yes. This one, 
because I think the survival of the human race is at stake, given mm -hmm. the climate change denier that's currently in office. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I have a, a question. Okay. Uh, who has the best chance of beating Trump, in your opinion? I, well, I, I would I'll, like to have some hope. So. I'll give you my opinion, but let's hear your opinions. Who do you think has the best chance of beating uh, Trump? Give me some analysis. I'm sure you're always sharing this over the dinner table or at the dining room, so here's your chance to show me how bright you are, and I'm sure you are. I think Biden has the best chance. Okay, and, and you, you say, give me a name and, a, and at least one reason why you selected okay. it. Just a minute. Okay. Okay. Bye. Because uh, he's uh, he's a, he's much more of a moderate, and so I, uh, as opposed to Elizabeth Warren and uh, and uh, Bernie Sanders, also I think I think I think he can uh, he he can stand up to uh, Trump, although. Hillary Clinton was able to also, and she didn't beat him, so I don't know. I, I just, uh, but I, I still think that Biden is the best chance we have. Okay, there's a Biden. I think Biden too, and it's, uh, I think it's because we can overvalue the debates. I mean, he's done sort of been so uh, fumbling, uh, but I think that people like him, and you, that that is just gonna go a long way and they trust him and right now they want somebody who will just get things back to normal. So I, I, I kind of I agree with that. Warren, yep. she has lots of ideas and people are saying she's far too, <laughs> far too left. But maybe not, maybe we'll change our minds on that. All right. Yeah, Warren's ideas are either the beauty or the bane of her campaign, depending on who, how you think about it. That's no question about it. I think, don't know, right? I, I think Warren's many policies and views are either the beauty or the bane of her campaign, depending on how you view it. Others, sorry. I think Jamal Hexburg has likely pissed very impossibly the best course because he's been uh, he's been in Massachusetts and done very well here. And that's the Democrat. And he's a black man. And we need a lot of the black people to sign. Yeah, let me just say something about Deval Patrick, and I, and I don't want to interrupt, but. People say, is there a window for Deval Patrick? I think they do. He does have a small window, a very small window, but it, there's a window. And this is my theory, and it's my theory alone, so you can tell me it's crazy. But I think it, it's connected to the impeachment hearing. So if you think about it, the impeachment hearings are going to start probably after the year, probably right around the time of the, of the Iowa and New Hampshire uh, primaries. And they could go on six to eight weeks. And you think about it, six of the candidates that are running for president of the United States, including people like Warren and Booker and Sanders, are senators. So they're going to have to be sitting in that, those hearings. I think if they, if they take a walk, it's going to look bad as hell. So I think they're going to have to sit there for those impeachment trial. It, it really is a trial. And what that does is leaves the field a little open for Buddha Judge and people like Deval Patrick and Bloomberg and others who are not going to be tied down by sitting in these endless trial that's going to be taking place within the Senate. I don't know. That's my view. I don't know if, if Deval Patrick agrees with me. And I was saying a year ago that I thought Deval Patrick would be a very strong candidate. I'm not convinced he will. Well, he's created a real problem for himself by announcing so late, and he's not raising much money, which is, going to, which is a problem at this stage. But uh, I do see that there might, he might have feel that there's a window for him and it's tied to the impeachment battle. Yeah, go ahead. If uh, Biden is the candidate, as several people have talked about, why isn't Obama not supporting him? Oh, I think Obama is supporting him pretty much. Uh, he is. Yes. Uh, I mean, Obama ha isn't overt because he's smart and he shouldn't be, you know, nobody, no former president is going to at this stage overtly support anybody with resources and so forth. 
But there's no question that Obama has a tie to uh, Biden, and Biden assuredly is trying to tie himself to the Obama star. A star which always diminishes over time. I mean, Obama may have been as popular amongst Democrats the day he left office, and every day that passes, he's a little less popular because, or just because that's the way things happen. Yes. Bloomberg, because he announced not having money issues, and because he turned up to uh, Trump. And the uh, revision that worked, good, and uh, uh, he has lots uh, of uh, good points in his favor. Yeah, let me say something about Bloomberg. Bloomberg is not going to have any problem raising money. He's much like Trump. And in that respect, that depending on how you see that, you might see that as a good thing or a bad thing. You've seen a number of, it's interesting, the billionaires you're seeing appearing on the Democratic side rather than the Republican side this year, the Tom Steyer, Steyer, Steyers, the, uh, the, uh, the Michael Bloombergs. The one thing that I think Michael Bloomberg does have going for him is he's able to raise money, and he also has a sweet spot on two issues that really appeal to across the board Democrats and people in the public that are not too controversial. It's not Medicare for all, it's gun rights and the, and the environment. So somebody talked about the environment. The two issues on which Bloomberg is considered to be quite progressive and are issues in which there's broad appeal within the public, certainly the Democratic electorate, is gun rights and, uh, and the environment. And he has been mayor of an urban city. Uh, so that he has going for him. He has other liabilities as well, having been a, at times, a Republican in his life and supporting Republican candidates and ties to Wall Street and so <laughs> forth. But uh, he's an interesting addition. So when and how is he gonna get going? Well, the way he's doing it is he's putting ads on about every 20 minutes on television. Uh, so that's one way you do it. And his numbers are increasing. He's going to be, I don't think he's going to, he may even be eligible. I don't think he's eligible for the next debate, but the next debate he will be. I'm almost predicting he will. Um, you mentioned Steyer. Um, he's certainly spending money like crazy on ads. Yes. I don't think he has really any chance of getting anywhere, but I wish he would consider spend, taking that money he's spending and give it to the congressional um, races for the, to try and get more Democrats to slip seats. Do you suppose he would ever think of something like that? I, I think he's going to spend plenty of money anywhere he wants. He's pretty well healed. But he's an interesting candidate. It's, uh, it's almost like, frankly, what I think uh, Trump's real, real purpose was in running in 2016, and to his great surprise, I think Trump won the nomination. I, th I think Trump wanted to run to really further his own uh, somewhat flagging uh, career as a television personality and to really create some buzz for his economic interests and his personal interests. That's what Tom Steyer is doing. That's what Andrew Yang is doing, I think, as well. And so we have these sorts of candidates who can essentially use the presidential nomination platform as a way to promote their personal economic interests or other interests. And there's, I guess, no problem with that, but you have that capacity. And I really think that was Trump's, uh, Trump's uh, goal in 2016. I think he's the most surprised per person in the world to think he's president of the United States. I think he, re I, I'm not even kidding on that. I think, the, and the most insightful interview about this is, is the, the interview with Howard Stern. It's uh, Anderson Cooper has an inner, if you want to look it up, uh, and, and Howard Stern is a very good friend of, of Trump's. And he talks about his relationship with Trump and, and Trump trying to get Howard Stern to support him. And, and Howard Stern essentially, and I think he's serious about this, Trump would have traded any cabinet position, anything to Howard Stern if Howard Stern would have supported uh, uh, Trump outright. But he has some real insights, and one of the insights that, Trump, that Stern has is that Trump likes winning. He doesn't like governing. He doesn't like you know, conducting business. He, doesn't, he likes winning. And so the challenge of winning was what he was all interested in. 
after he won, he, got, he lost interest in it, I think. But he's now president, so uh, he has to show some interest in it. And that's, by the way, something that I think the Democrats got to be a little fearful of during the impeachment battle. Trump is somewhat at his best in, in objective terms, and maybe you'll disagree with me, but I think Trump is at his best sometime when he's battling something, and the battling the impeachment battle. He may not be battling the way a lot of Democrats and other people want him to be battling, but he's putting up a fight. It's an interesting fight. It's kind of a depends on how you think about how he's fighting, whether it's a fair fight, but it's working. And so this is a guy who's a bit of a cult hero who's putting up a fight, and the fact that he's putting up a fight is something that, uh, that Trump is very good at, I think. I'd be interested in your comment with regard to Bloomberg in the fact that he really is new as far as the nation is concerned. He's a new candidate. The Democrats are, their story is out and has been out for such a long time. And the only thing that Bloomberg had against him was the search and seize, uh, seize and search, search situation. Yeah. Uh, what were your thoughts there? Well, I, I think in general, Bloomberg is not considered, if you will, a progressive darling. And to the extent that there are people in the party who remember the two ideas about mobilizing the base or broadening one's appeal. To the, to the mobilizing the base people, the, the belief is you have to have a Democratic Party that stands for something, not just defeating Trump. Well, doesn't he have the chance of getting more Republican votes than anybody else? Well, that appeals to the other strategy, which is who can defeat Trump is the principal consideration. Right. And so it depends on where one falls on that spectrum. Now, hopefully, the Democrats, are their, their great desire is to have somebody who can chew gum and who can do two things at the same time, right? That is, that they can beat Trump and pr provide a, a policy agenda that's forward-looking. That's going to be the trick. And uh, if they can do that, they will have found their best candidate. But if not, they've got to choose one or the other. That's the belief. That's the really discussion that's taking place amongst the Democratic electorate. It's, it's clear the discussion that's taking here. For people who talk about Biden as the best person to beat uh, Trump, for those people, the idea of beating Trump, I think, is key. For people like this gentleman back there who said the environment is the critical issue, he's talking about an issue really is the principal thing that's driving, I, I would imply by that, his choice about who can speak to the critical issue, not simply anybody who could beat Trump. Yeah, but I have a question. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. This has been, this has been great. Well, you've been great. I, I, <laughs> I won't say the name yet, but I, the candidate that I really am excited about is a person who is intelligent, a scholar, an educator, has been in government a short time, <coughs> speaks several languages, and I love Mayor Pete. I, I know it's a long shot, but whenever you hear him speaking, he's calm, he's articulate, and he, he's just... He's Buddha judge. Yeah, oh, Mayor, I call him Mayor Pete. Yeah. Oh, and I just think, you know, if Obama can win, I think Mayor Pete could do it too. And he's got my vote. <laughs> well, as I say, he's the latest uh, favorite, and whether he will sustain himself or not is another question. But uh, he has some appeal, there's no question about it. He has. Unfortunately, in the minds of many people who will not vote for a gay man for president of the United States, I just think that's, that's key, just like some people will not vote for a woman and some people won't vote for a black male or female for president. Uh, but the big knock on Buttigieg by some people is not enough experience at the federal level, but uh, it's interesting because there are candidates who have combined, there are candidates who are running who have combined both the mayoral experience and the, the senatorial experience, if you think about Cory Booker. But Cory Booker's candidacy has not been able to catch, and his message is very similar to Buttigieg's, very moderate, very across the board, let's all come together. But for whatever reason, and, and, the, and they're working against him maybe being a black male, I don't know, but. Uh, Cory Booker's message has not been able to catch fire. And he's somebody who does seem, for those people who say somebody should, that Buttigieg must have, should have more federal experience as a senator, 
to have his experience as a mayor. Uh, I just think that somebody like Cory Booker has had both. Uh, so has Bernie Sanders, by the way, as mayor of Burlington and as a senator as well. I forgot to mention also that Mayor Pete served in the military as well. Yeah. I mean, his experience is so broad. Yeah, so is, so is Bernie. Bernie, we forget, has served in the military, he's been a mayor, and he's been a senator for many years. Uh, you know, the gentleman back here who's concerned about the environment, I am too, but we got to get the person elected first before he or she can do anything. But my question is, what do you think about this impeachment hearing? To me, to me, I'm sorry, I think it's much ado about, not that I don't think he deserves, I don't know, he certainly deserves to be held up to what he's done and to be maybe censured, but uh, I mean, it seems to me like so much time and I don't know if wasted is the right word, but geez, didn't we elect these people to, to do things for us? I mean, they don't seem to be, I'm concerned about gun control, um, you know, different things that, that this impeachment thing. I just have a fear it's gonna turn out like the Mueller report. We waited and waited and waited and I didn't know much came out of it as far as I'm concerned. You know, you already know what the outcome of this little drama is going to be. So to that, it's not a lot of surprise. The, the, the Democratic House is going to impeach Donald Trump and the Republican Senate is going to uh, exonerate him in the trial. You know that outcome. So without going over the whole debate about the impeachment, the question is what are the political consequences? Look, I believe it does not help Donald Trump to be a, a president who's facing impeachment charges and having people talk about him in this way, having witness after witness, solid people talking about his apparent abuse of power and his misdeeds. I mean, it just doesn't help. Now, would he be better off if he didn't have it? I think he would be better off politically if he did not have an impeachment hanging over his head. Uh, now, is that going to sway a significant number of Republicans who are going to be, you know, talk about the never Trumpers. There's the always Trumpers, too, on the other side, who will always support him. And those people are not going to be swayed by anything. Those are the ones who I think Trump understood when he says he can walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and nobody's going to pay attention to it. Those are the ones who said when Trump said in private that he could grab a woman, you know, by her genitals and get away with it. And because he's Donald Trump, I think to that crowd, he's right about that. That's his own assessment. And I think he's right about that. But the question is, uh, it, does it help him to be an impeached president, even if he's not one that's found not, not convicted by the Senate? And I think on balance, it doesn't help him. Now, is it going to be enough to defeat him? I don't know. But uh, on one of the issues that people raised about, you know, when, when one talks about policy over personality, people talk about people like uh, Elizabeth Warren, no question about it. And they talk about Bernie Sanders. They say that their Medicare for all policies are too radical, that they're too left and so forth. You know, that may be true, but I'm telling you, remember, this is the first part of the game. You're appealing to a Democratic electorate. Democratic electorate tends to be more progressive and more left than the general public. And the fact is that candidates can switch. They can move back to the middle, as you must do to win a general election. And my point about, let's say, health care. So lots of people get the heebie-jeebies, I suppose, although most of the public does support, actually, the idea of some larger government role in health care. And so the notion is that, that people say that that Bernie Sanders or the Democrats are going to be in, in tough sledding if they propose something like a public option, a public, uh, uh, publicly controlled health care. But the point is, in a general election, you're going to have a debate on health care. And there's, and there's Donald Trump's plan on the one hand, and then there's Elizabeth Warren. Now you're not talking into a void. You're comparing things. So what's Donald Trump's plan going to be on health care? If it's going to be cutting people off of pre-existing pre conditions, which he's proposed to do, even getting rid of Obamacare, which is immensely popular, 
<clears throat> that's the stated position of uh, Donald Trump. Now you have something to compare about. And maybe Elizabeth Warren's plan looks fairly progressive and scary, but may maybe even scarier is to turn the clock back to pre-Obamacare uh, uh, days. See, that's the problem. If, if you look at these things in a vacuum, of course, anything that, that, that uh, somebody's progressive, suggesting on the progressive side might look like out of the mainstream. But when you have a general election, you have a debate on health care, who's going to win that debate? I'm not convinced that it's a losing position for the Democrats to take. It may be, but I don't think it's a losing position necessarily. So you've helped us a lot with uh, some analysis, but you, we haven't yet heard how you kind of imagine it's going to play out. And I don't know, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it would be interesting. <laughs> well, let me say that while I did not predict because I would be a lot richer man and, and a lot more uh, respected if I would have predicted that uh, Trump would have won in 2016. I did say... Did not, did not win the popular vote. I, uh, I know, but I know the Electoral College and how it works, too. And uh, I did say that, look, the second name on the ballot, when we elect a president of the United States, we're, we always have at least two major nominees, and that second name is very important, no matter who it is. Now, Barry Goldwater, I wouldn't have put my money on, nor would I put my money on George McGovern. I would have put a little bit of money on Donald Trump, however. Not a lot, but I would have put some money on him because, you know, for whatever reason, that second name on the ballot is pretty critical, and they always have a chance. Not a great chance, but a decent chance because you have two names on the ballot. And I had not predicted that, but I thought Trump was not an unreasonable choice, given my views about the American public, frankly, and about the forces that are taking place within the country, which really are really getting played out in the presidential election in our own divisions, which go well beyond Democrat and Republican. They have to do with the changing demographics of the country really more than anything. And I think it's way beyond economics, too. So given that reality, I thought Trump was his message was possible. And the guy's a rock star. He really is. He's, he's hard to imagine in those terms, but he truly is. He, he's a charismatic figure, and he's a cult hero to a lot of people. And that's a hard piece of lightning to capture. But, and those who are outside of the cult hero worship uh, can't understand it. But those who are in it, they're in it pretty deep, and they're up to their eyeballs in it. And it's great appeal to that. What did you mean by the second name on the ballot? What, what were you talking about? There's, the Democrats put a candidate for it and the Republicans put a candidate for it. Hillary Clinton was one candidate who had some flaws and problems. And the Republican candidate was Donald Trump. He had the other name on the ballot. And that second name on the ballot can pull off some surprises. Are you talking about the vice president? No, I'm talking about the other candidate who's running in the final. Somebody mentioned Truman in 52, as, uh, I mean, in 48 as the, as the election. Well, look at Truman. Truman was... was so far behind uh, Dewey in 48 that they stopped even polling because they didn't want to waste their money. So every, I don't know if anybody's here to actually remember that campaign. I must say I wasn't, but uh, uh, in 48. So if you were here to remember it, you would have remembered that everybody thought that Truman was going to lose by a landslide. You know, the famous uh, Chicago Daily News uh, cover that says Dewey beats Truman and Truman holding that thing up. And that was reflected also amongst prognosticators. They stopped doing polling because they didn't want to waste any money doing polls because the outcome was so clear. And of course, we know what happened there. And so the second name on the ballot was Harry Truman in 1948. The second name on the ballot was, was Donald Trump in, 19, in 2016. Uh, she asked, are people voting? If I get, now I don't want to do this, but I'm going to give a long lecture on how people vote in elections. And the clearest predictor, let me just put it this way, the clearest predictor how people are going to vote, if I were to bet, bet my house and, my, and your house and, and your fortune on one question I could ask you to predict how you're going to vote, I would ask, generally speaking, do you see yourselves as a Republican, Democrat, Independent, or what? And based upon your answer to that question, I would put my, vote, my bet down on who you're going to vote for. If you're a Democrat, you're almost certainly going to vote for the Democratic candidate. Now, there's some exceptions, and many of you can say them, 
So if you're going to bet for some basis, if you say you're a Republican, the chances are you're going to vote for the Republican candidate, even if it's uh, Donald Trump. I'm saying if there's one piece of, of information you can learn about anybody to place a bet on how they're going to behave. Now, of course, what that means is that who de decides elections then? Well, it means those people in the middle who are neither Democrats or Republicans or are weak Democrats or weak Republicans instead of strong Democrats or strong, they're the ones who would decide American elections. Are they big? They are and they're growing, but they switch, and they, but they don't have to be very big. So if you have just a few Democrats who end up uh, abandoning the Democratic candidate and going over to the other side, or if you have some, a, a fairly bigger than 50% of the people who are undecided to go to one side or the other side, they decide American elections. It comes back to the question, if there are a few Republicans who make that switch rather than Democrats, I would think that would swing the election. I think that I, I think there are a lot of people who may think that Trump is doing the right things, but he's doing it the wrong way. And so that could make it a big vote. The, the, the next, last election was pretty close. Well, that, that's true. The, the power of the parties now, the fact of the matter is, and, and I'll end with this point, the, and I would have begun my, a general lecture on this if I was lecturing on how people behave politically. Most people, even though they can say to them, if I ask you the question, can answer the question, generally speaking, do you see yourself as a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or what? The fact is that most people can answer that question. And it's usually based not on anything ideological or anything. Much of it is based on, it's like religion. If your parents were Democrats, you're a de Democrat. If your parents are Republican, you're a Republican. Now, there's some exceptions, but it's about as primordial as that, as, as established, but yet it has a power. Uh, I'll end with the story. The Theodore Roosevelt, the famous Republican president, was once giving a rally in a room like this, a Republican rally, and he was a rabble-rousing speaker, and he was getting the crowd going. It's at the back of the room, some guy stood up and said, I am a Democrat. Everybody turns around and looks at this guy, this Republican guy, this guy, and finally, so Roosevelt goes on, he goes, guy stands up again and says, I am a Democrat. And so Roosevelt stops and he says, okay, sir, I says, I understand you're a Democrat. And the guy says, damn right, I'm a Democrat. He says, well, he says, okay, he says, uh, why are you a Democrat? He says, well, my daddy was a Democrat, my granddaddy was a Democrat, my, gra my great granddaddy was a Democrat, and I'm a Democrat. And Roosevelt says, well, what if your daddy was a jackass, your grandfather was a jackass, and your dad grandfather, what would that make you? And the guy says, a Republican. <laughs> so uh, party ties are pretty strong. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much.